on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where will you have us go to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the householder, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I am to eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. And the disciples set out and went to the city, and found it as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, Jesus came with the twelve. And as they were at the table eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, Is it I? I am Simon the Zealot. Before Jesus called me, I belonged to a group of hot-headed, bloodthirsty revolutionaries known as the Zealots. We were all for our rebellion against Rome. We believed in crushing our enemies under our heels to restore the ancient glory that was Israel's during the day of David and Solomon. Yet Jesus told of another kind of kingdom, the kingdom of the human heart, where God reigns there supremely. Since I have heard him, I have changed my mind and also my allegiance. He has shown me that the conquest of the heart is the only true sincere and lasting conquest. So I have given him my highest loyalty and my deepest devotion. In military uh, parlance, I have unconditionally and completely surrendered myself to him, to think his thoughts, to love as he loves, obey as he obeys, and serve as he serves. This surrender has not imprisoned me. It has set me free for the first time in my life. I'm not afraid of Rome any longer. She is mighty. But God is almighty, and we will conquer her by outliving and outloving her in the name of God, whom Jesus has revealed unto us, Jesus whom we call our Savior and our Lord. Now the Master says that there's a spiritual Roman among us, one who would attempt to take by force what could only be conquered by love. Who could it be? Is it me because I'm the only zealot among the group? Is it I? Is it I? After Jesus had called Peter and Andrew to come and follow him, he came to me, John, and my brother James. We were on a boat one day with our father Zebedee tending to our nets when Jesus came and asked us to follow him. So we immediately left behind our boat, our careers, and our father to follow Jesus. 
And in my time with Jesus, I tried to understand him by simply loving him. Sometimes I thought Jesus was just as much of God that could be in a human form. Then other times I found myself tempted to believe that he is the same God that existed before creation and will exist far past the end of time. That he is the word of God in human flesh that has come to speak to every man, woman, and child of every age and for every age to come. And yet, I love him as a person. And he has shown that same love back to me. Sometimes, Jesus calls me the beloved disciple. I've shared in his trials, and I've shared in his hours of victory. I was there on the Mount of Transfiguration, where we got to behold his glory. He sometimes calls James and I the sons of thunder, which is ironic because we're not loud and boisterous men. We're quiet and hardworking. Though we tend to be a little impatient with those who reject Jesus. But nevertheless, he entrusted Peter and I to arrange the celebration of the Passover here in this upper room tonight. He tasked us with this because he considers Peter and I to be in his close, intimate inner circle. After all, it was to me that Jesus told me about his conversation with Nicodemus where he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and that he whoever shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I hope one day to write down the words of the teacher and write down his actions and his miracles so that way future generations may be able to look back and read and see Jesus the Christ, the Jesus that I have had the privilege of knowing. And then through reading and through believing in him that they will also receive everlasting life. And yet, he tells us that one of us is a betrayer. Well, it couldn't be Peter, and it couldn't be Andrew. It certainly couldn't be my brother James. Well, could it be me, John, the beloved disciple? Is it I? Is it I? My name is Nathaniel. Like many of the others, I am a fisherman. I am from Cana of Galilee, where Jesus performed his first public miracle, turning water into wine at a wedding feast. I was a disciple of John the Baptizer, and it was John who introduced me to Jesus at Bethany. My friend Peter came to me and said, we have found him, Jesus of Nazareth, son of God. I said to him, can anything good come from Nazareth? He replied, come and see. When I saw Jesus, he said to me, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. I said to him, how do you know me? He said, when you were with Peter, I saw you under the fig tree. It was then I confessed my faith. Since that time, I have served him as a disciple. And now he tells us that one of us will betray him. How can that be? Can a traitor be amongst his friends? Is it I? Is it I?
My name is James. I'm the brother of John. Jesus called us about three years ago while we were mending our nets, and that's when we started to follow him. We were honored to be his disciples and humbled when he chose us to be among the 12 apostles. I was with Jesus when he healed Peter's mother-in-law from her fever. I was also with him in the home of Jerry's when he brought back his young daughter from the sleep of death. On the Mount of Transfiguration, I saw Jesus talking to Moses and Elijah. Our mother, Salome, was very ambitious on our behalf, and she urged us to press our claims upon Jesus. On the way to Jerusalem, we made this request of him. We said, Lord, grant us to sit at your left and right hand as you enter into your kingdom. He replied and said, you do not know what you are asking. Are you to drink the cup that I am to drink or be baptized in my baptism? We replied, Lord, we are able. Then he said that surely we would drink his cup and be baptized in his baptism, but he did not have the power to grant us to sit one at his left hand and the other at his right as he entered into his new kingdom. The others were very angry at our request. Jesus reminded us that he would be first, would be the servant of all. He demonstrated that to us by washing our feet before supper. Once in a certain Samaritan village, uh, we heard that they were not receiving God like we thought that they should be. So we asked God to bring down fire and destroy them. Jesus rebuked us as only he could. He reminded us that God's way is a way of love. Now he tells us that one of the people to whom he teaches that love would soon betray him. Who could it be? Is it I? Is it I? My name is Andrew. I am the brother of Simon Peter, the one who brought his own brother to the Lord. You know, I'm not a very gifted man. I'm really more of an ordinary man, like many of you. But I've always just tried to use what gifts and abilities I have to serve the master. They call me Andrew the bringer because, well, that's what I do. I bring people to Jesus. I mean, I brought my brother to Jesus and look at the change in his life and what's happened. Oh, and that day that Jesus fed the 5,000, I'm the one that brought that little boy to the Lord with his five loaves and two fishes. And it was incredible how he multiplied the loaves and fishes so that everyone had their full. That was an amazing day. And just recently, while we've been here in Jerusalem, some Greeks came all the way because they just wanted to see Jesus. And well, I did what I do. I brought them to Jesus too. He must see something in me that the others overlook because he did choose me to be one of his 12 apostles. I've always just tried to be close to him. We've been through so much together. We've seen some incredible things and there have been some really hard days too. But through everything I have seen, I am convinced deep in my heart that he is the Lamb of God. Even though I haven't been in the inner circle like my brother Peter, Jesus has never made me feel like I was in the outer circle. I've always just tried to be a true friend and companion to my Lord. After all, what more could life afford a simple fisherman like me? And now he tells us one of us is going to betray him. It's unthinkable. How could they get away with that in their own heart? Who could it be? Could it be Andrew, is it I? Is it I?
I am Thomas the twin, or Thomas called Didymus, which means twin. While I do not look upon life with gloom or despondency, I demand proof before I believe. I want to see before I commit myself to anything. Yet I'm not a man of doubt. Rather, I sometimes see myself as a man of daring. I remember the day that Mary and Martha sent the message to Jesus that their brother Lazarus was seriously ill. When Jesus knew that he had died, Jesus turned to us and said, let us go to him. We knew the opposition to Jesus was growing. And some of the apostles did not want to go to Bethany. They feared the unseen danger. But I spoke out and rebuked them all, saying, Yes, let us go with him, that we may die with him. Why do people remember my fears and forget my courage? Why do people remember my doubts and forget my faith? I used to go fishing with some of the others. And I can remember when Jesus was speaking the Beatitudes from the horns of Hatton above the lake during his first year of ministry. And I, I, I remember him rebuking the winds and the waves of stormy Galilee. He healed the sick. He cured the diseased. He opened the eyes of the blind, unstopped the ears of the deaf, cleansed the lepers, and proclaimed the good news to the poor. Yet opposition has developed and grown to a white heat. His enemies are determined to destroy him. And why? Because the God he reveals is bigger than the petty little man-made deities that they have enshrined upon the altars of their hearts and in their worshiping places. He would bring us up to God. His enemies would cut God down to their own size. He would make us God's servants. They would make God their servant. And yet now he says that even among us, his chosen twelve, one of us is a traitor. Is he speaking to me? Is he rebuking me for my lack of faith, lack of courage? Could it be Thomas? Is it I? Is it I? one of the disciples whom Jesus called to be an apostle. The 12 tribes of Israel were the cornerstone of the old Jewish kingdom. In like manner, Jesus chose 12 of us to be the cornerstones of the new kingdom. I feel unworthy to be numbered among the apostles, but he selected me, and I will always remember that day. I'll never forget after night in prayer, he gave us authority over unclean spirits and the power to heal all kinds of disease and infirmity. Then he commissioned us to go forth and preach that the kingdom of God is at hand. He told us to be wise as serpents, but as innocent as doves, because he was sending us forth as sheep into the midst of wolves. I was in Jerusalem when he gave the great invitation Come, take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am meek 
lowly at heart. You will find rest unto your soul, because my yoke is easy, but my burden is light. Now the burden thrust upon us is the knowledge that one of us will betray us. Who can it be? Which one is the traitor? Is it the man we least suspect? Or might all of us betray him before the night is over? Is it I? Is it I? fishing on the Sea of Galilee when Jesus came by and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so we did. We left our nets and we followed him. He even used our boat as a wayside pulpit to preach to the multitudes, the great multitudes that followed him. I remember one time when we were out on the sea, he said, Simon, let down your nets that we might have something to eat. I remember being exasperated and saying, we have been fishing all day and have caught nothing. But at your word, we'll try again. And then a miracle happened. We caught so many fish. We had to call other nearby boats in just to help contain the catch. And when we came back to shore, I fell to my knees. And I said, depart from me, O Lord. I, I am a sinful man. But he raised me to my feet. And he said, from now on, you will be fishing for men. He even changed my name from Simon to Peter, which means the rock. And when we were near Caesarea Philippi, I confessed him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, on this rock, I will build my church. But then a moment later, I protested his going to Jerusalem to suffer death at the hands of evil men. And he rebuked me, saying, get behind me. Satan. So you see, I guess I'm a mixture of good and of evil, of godliness and of ungodliness. But I want to prove to him that my love and my loyalty, that my devotion is sincere and genuine. When he told us that one of us was to betray him, I said, not I, O oh Lord. I would follow you even unto death. But he warned me that before the night is over, before the rooster crowed twice, I would deny him three times. He prayed for me, for he said Satan wanted me so that he could <coughs> sift me like wheat. The others, the others call me the big fisherman. But in his presence, I feel small and unworthy. I don't know how this could be. Will I deny him? Will I? Deny him before the rooster crows? And, and if I do, what will he do? Will he deny me? Will he disown me? Will he close the doors of the heavenly kingdom to me? If I knew who the scoundrel was, I would pierce his heart with my knife. Would it be my own heart that I'd have to pierce? 
Lord, grant that it might not be so. And yet, I, I keep asking and wondering, is it I? Lord, is it I? My name is Philip. I come from Bethsaida in Galilee. <clears throat> While some friends and I were in Bethany listening to John the Baptist, Jesus called us to become his disciples. All of us turned and followed. I went and got my companion Nathaniel, and I was overjoyed when Jesus accepted him as an apostle also. During these past years in close fellowship with Jesus, my faith in God has grown stronger and deeper. I remember well before he fed the 5,000, five loaves and two fish, asking him and the others, where are we to buy bread that all of these might eat? Little did I know that Andrew was bringing a young boy with his lunch to Jesus. And when the Greeks came to me requesting an interview with the master, I turned them over to Andrew, who brought them to Jesus. I'm always wanting to know more about the nature and person of God. But when Jesus began to tell us that God was our Heavenly Father, it's almost beyond my understanding. However, since been, I've been listening to the, the, Jesus' words, I've really grown to understand what he's telling us. In fact, I can almost say that anyone who has seen Jesus has seen the Father, because everything I would want to find in the Father do I find in Jesus, and nothing I would not want to find in the Father do I find in the Son. Having seen the Father through him, he shocks us by telling us there's a betrayer in our midst. Does the betrayer know that by betraying Jesus, he's betraying God? That in conspiring against Jesus, he's conspiring against God? Can one of us be so blind? Who could it be? Could it be Philip? Is it I? Is it I? James. <clears throat> but since many men bear that familiar name, I'm also known as James the Lesser, being lesser in size than men of the same name. Since my father's name is Alpheus, I'm also known as James the son of Alpheus. Our family is a proud family, tracing our ancestry back to the tribe of Gad, one of the twelve sons of Jacob. I'll never forget the first time I saw the master. I was walking down the road when I came upon a place where John was baptizing. I became curious, so I stepped aside for a closer look. Jesus asked John to baptize him, but he refused. Jesus insisted. After John had baptized the Lord, the Holy Spirit descended from heaven in the form of a dove, and a voice from heaven came saying, This is my Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So when Jesus asked me to follow and be one of his disciples, naturally I followed him. At the conclusion of his first year of ministry, Jesus asked me to be one of his apostles. And since that time, I've walked with him, talked with him, eaten with him, and tried to learn as much as I can about him and his heavenly father as possible. And now, 
You learn one of us is to betray him. Surely that can't be. The betrayer must be out of his mind. But I can't help but wonder. Is it I? Is it I? My name is Matthew. <clears throat> like Zacchaeus, I'm a tax collector. Some call me Levi, and others call me Matthew the Publican. When my character was changed through my fellowship with Jesus, he called me Matthew. One day as I was collecting taxes, Jesus came up to me and said, Come, follow me. So I followed him. Later, I held a feast for Jesus in my home. Many of Jesus' friends and many of my business associates were there. It was a royal occasion to entertain Jesus and his disciples. When some Pharisees complained that Jesus was eating with, sin with sinners and publicans, he said to them, it is not those who are well that need a physician, but those who are sick. And then he reminded them of the words of Hosea, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And then adding his own significant words, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. From the day I repented and followed him, I have studied the Old Testament. And I am thoroughly convinced that Jesus is the fulfillment of every Old Testament prophecy of the coming Messiah. Someday, I hope to write a paper proving his Messiahship from our own Old Testament. I have listened to him closely, and I hope to record the heart of his sermons of the good news of the kingdom of God, especially that first sermon on that mountain in Galilee three years ago. It's a new gospel, good news for all the world, and yet he has just spoken bad news tragic news that one of us will betray him. Who could it be? Will, will they suspect me because I was once a hated tax collector? Do I suspect myself? Is it I? Is it I? All the others are from Galilee. My home is in the village of Kerioth in Judea. Hence, I am known as Judas of Kerioth, or Judas Iscariot, the only Judean among the group of apostles. The others had great confidence in me. They elected me to be their treasurer. And surely Jesus believed in me. He chose me. He selected me to be one of the twelve despite what the others may say behind my back about my impatience or my stinginess, my ambition, he chose me. Now, some say that I've appropriated these funds for my own personal use, and that Jesus' words about greed and the love of money were aimed at me in particular. 
Still others, they like to insinuate that Jesus was talking about me when he asked, Have I chose you twelve, and one of you is a devil? I mean, of course I complained when Mary washed his feet with that expensive ointment and perfume. I still think it was a waste of money. And if I've conspired with the chief priests, and if, if I have 30 pieces of silver on my person, well, that's my affair. Look, I believe in Jesus. Really, I, I do. But somebody had to force the issue. Make him assert himself as God's Messiah. He refuses to make such a move. Well, I've made one. He hints that he knows what I've done. He said as much earlier when washing my feet, or, or at dinner uh, when we dipped our bread in the same dish. But I have my reasons. My soul is not as black as some say it is. Neither is your soul as white. I mean, what would you do if you were in my place and you wanted Jesus to do something drastic, startling to usher in his kingdom? What would you do? And if you were in his place, what would you do? Should I ignore his remark? <laughs> Pretend he didn't say it at all? Or maybe, like the others, I should piously and self-righteously ask, is it I? Is it I? they were eating, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We invite you to come forward for communion.
After dinner, Jesus went out to pray. There, he was arrested and taken to trial. He was condemned to death. He was taken to Golgotha, the skull, where he was crucified. <laughs> 